afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, a few announcements, uh, several actually. Be sure you sign the roll sheet. If you don't sign the roll sheet, then you don't get credit. And that would be sad for anybody. And so we're looking at it right there. So be sure you sign the roll sheet. Okay. Your diligence is um, important. Uh, Dr. Music is going to talk to us a moment about the Pruitt Symposium. Uh, the Pruitt Symposium happens uh, periodically <coughs> on the Pruitt campus and uh, has different emphases, but this year it's on uh, preserving and celebrating the black gospel heritage, the black sacred music heritage. And so uh, you might be interested in some of the sessions of that. You can find the full schedule on, on this website, baylor.edu slash Pruitt, one T uh, there. But also, uh, we have been given, because of the School of Music's participation in this, 10 tickets to lunches. Uh, they're free lunches, or well, lunches if you got the ticket. And there's a special speaker at each of those. And these three lunches under the times are October 23rd. That's Thursday of next week, Friday, and Saturday. And so if you're interested in uh, acquiring one of those tickets, I have a sign-up sheet here, and I'll put it on the table there. And so I'll sign up for that after the session this evening. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Very good. A couple of other announcements. You should have gotten an email about mosaic rehearsal or mosaic planning um, meetings coming up soon. I think those maybe start next Monday evening, but you've gotten an email about that, so keep that in mind, please. That's important and something that uh, would encourage you to participate in. It's a valuable experience, and um, if you've done it, do it again. If you've not, I urge you to do it. A second thing is the Alleluia Conference is every summer here at Baylor. It's a uh, church music, a national church music event, and I urge you to go ahead and make your plans for that. I can't remember exactly the dates as I'm standing here, but um, July 19 through 21 through 24. Okay. Yeah, um, that's right. So uh, those dates that, that I've already forgotten now. Actually, um, 21. Okay, that's, those are the dates next summer. So mark those dates and be here. Uh, we would really encourage you to participate in the Holy Congress. Thirdly, if you, uh, you should have gotten an email today from Dr. Music about internships, graduate, gra um, I'm sorry, undergraduate internships for next summer. So if you um, need to come to that meeting, if you're a junior or a senior and plan to do an internship next summer, there's a meeting coming up. Check that. There's also an email that went out today. If you're interested in uh, talking to us about the potential for graduate, graduate study at Baylor. We will have a meeting that will be our faculty plus uh, Truett people will be there to talk about that. If you're a junior or a senior particularly, it would be a good time for you to start exploring what it might look like if you stayed at Baylor for graduate study. And um, two more quick things. On November 18th, we, have, um, we were able to have Michael Gunger here uh, and he is going to be here on a Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock on the, November 18th. You'll be hearing about that, but I wanted you to go ahead and put that on your calendar. We'll have a conversation with Michael Tiger that will be in um, Versailles Hall 2. Okay? Say the time again. Uh, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. That Tuesday the eight, is the 18th, right? Yeah. Okay. It's Tuesday the 18th. Yeah. And that's an extra thing that, we're, that we've been able to connect. Uh, Gunger will be here the night before doing a concert, and they're going to they're have a couple of days in here, and they're going to hang out and be with us. Yes? Is that like an open invitation? It is. Okay. Yeah, it's an open invitation for anyone. Yeah. What time did you say? Six o'clock. Yeah. And lastly, if you did not come to, if you would like to consider going to El Salvador in May, and you did not come to one of the meetings last week, there will be another meeting tonight at 9 in 109. So kind of a makeup meeting if you weren't able to be at one of the meetings last week. Again, I encourage you to consider that trip. It will not be expensive in the big scheme of things. And um, we'd love to have you be a part of that. There's a lot of interest, so consider it. Can I say one more thing about the Pruitt Symposium? If you do want to go to one of the lunches, you need to sign up tonight, because I have to let them know tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that was the, the Center for Christian Music Studies is the sponsor for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Is the one on the 25th for the gospel brunch? Yes. Or, okay. 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 There's a gospel <laughs> choir at the brunch. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and can I, while we're on yeah, the Pruitt please. Symposium, can I say one more thing? On that um, October 24th, which is the Friday, um, you can get a free dinner um, if you participate in the Gospel Choir. And uh, Dr. Max Seal has more information about that, uh, but we're going to be having a rehearsal. One of my um, 9 o'clock classes, my Song of the Church class, next week we're going to have a rehearsal of some of the music in preparation for the rehearsal that's going to be Friday night at 5.30. So 5.30 at 7th and James Baptist, um, if you're interested in the choir, um, you'll show up, um, they'll rehearse, you know, people who have heard the music before, so again, you know, get hooked up with Dr. Max Seal or with that with my class for a rehearsal if you want to be involved. But we'll feed you dinner and you'll get to be part of the mass um, choir, people from Dallas, people from Waco, um, all gathering together to, to sing under the leadership of uh, Dr. James Abington that evening. You'll enjoy that time very much. Yes. I've worked with him a number of times and he's fun and delightful and funny and yeah. all kinds of oh. things. So yeah. He's great. He's great. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, Lots of things. Now, don't be overwhelmed by so much. Be grateful, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of good things going on, uh, a lot of things happening. But these are things that you can only get at Baylor. So be happy that you're here, and wow, what, a, what an important array of diverse things that you can be a part of here. Uh, Black Gospel to Gunger to El Salvador. Um, Hallelujah. There you go. Okay. Uh, as, so to launch us, today we are very pleased that uh, Dr. Ingalls is going to share with us. From time to time in this forum, we ask a faculty person to do that, and especially with uh, Dr. Ingalls being new. Um, I, some of you heard her presentations last year when she came, um, and then lots of you have. Some of you are in her classes, some of you are. So we thought it would be a very wonderful thing for us to get to share with her today and hear some of the things that she's working on. So Dr. Ingalls, welcome. It's a to you. Well, thank you um, to, uh, to Doctors uh, Music and Bradley for extending uh, this opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I'm going to be presenting some thoughts um, this evening on performance in connection to church music. And uh, in all my classes, you probably, uh, if you're in my class, you've heard me say this, uh, that it is perfectly acceptable to self-plagiarize. So to take your own ideas and uh, develop them a little bit further, you know, from, uh, from one paper to another. So I will admit I'm engaging in a bit of self-plagiarism uh, this evening from an earlier piece, but I do plan to sprinkle in some, um, some new and some additional insights as well. Uh, so as, as a researcher, I use ethnographic field research methods to gather information about musical practices. And for those of you not in one of my classes who uh, will all be experts in ethnography by the end of the semester, um, ethnography is a hands-on research method that's kind of, kind of like journalism, that involves interviewing people, observing musical events, um, sometimes participating in them as well. So um, I study contemporary worship music um, and its culture um, firsthand in places where people come together to sing or listen to worship music together, whether these are churches, concerts, conferences, city streets, or um, online communities. So I had an intense period um, a few years back where I went to a lot of different worship events, um, sometimes four different churches on a Sunday. Um, and actually, I think I only did that once. <laughs> that was too much. Um, but I, you know, so I went to a, you know, just two 20,000 attendee college student conferences back to back. Um, sometimes in the middle of, uh, in the middle of going to all of these events, I started noticing a trend. Worship leaders of all stripes were insisting that they were not performing and announced loudly and sometimes repeatedly that what we were experiencing was not a performance. So, pick on, pick on this on the United um, I've, I've heard Chris Tomlin tell crowds in Nashville, Atlanta, and Toronto, I'm not here to perform for you, but to lead you in worship. And it wasn't just mass concerts and conferences, it happened in churches, too. I heard it at a 2,000 attender um, Nashville church that had a full-time producer on staff. I heard it from the leader of the two-member worship team at my in-law's church of 30 people in uh, northeast Oklahoma. So this was you know, kind of everywhere. So with respected leaders left and right insisting that they were not performing, uh, it seems worship leaders were looking everywhere for advice as to how not to perform. 
Everyone on the Christian blogosphere had an opinion about it. Paul Belosh weighed in in the Modern Worship series, and Worship Leader Magazine devoted a whole issue to performance. Um, so why were, um, maybe perhaps are, um, some of uh, these Christian musicians from celebrity worship leaders to leaders of congregations of 30 so eager to distance themselves from performance? Why was, uh, what has performance come to mean that makes it such a dirty word? So in speaking to people and interpreting what worship leaders were, uh, were saying in blogs, videos, and magazines, um, I came to the conclusion that U.S. Christians kind of meant two things by performance. So performance was being used um, to contrast two things that we as Christians are supposed to value. The quality of authenticity and the action of participation. So in the first instance, in the context of Christian worship, um, people were using the word performance to describe what happens when somebody acts in a way that's inconsistent with the way they really feel or the way they are in real life. So we uh, impute questionable motives to their actions. Performers, in this sense, act with an intention to deceive or to manipulate like an actor um, adopting a persona. Persona, that word for mask, um, the original metaphor from which we get the word hypocrite. So this emphasis on performance seems to run against the imperative we often hear to be authentic, to express true feelings, to try, um, you know, to, uh, to to try to be someone, or not to try to be someone that we're not. Conceive this way of um, authenticity, being natural and just doing what comes to us, and performance, self-consciously playing some kind of scripted role, seem to be at odds with one another. That meant that anything that feels too scripted, um, you know, rather than being spontaneous, was sort of automatically suspect. In the second instance, performance was used to contrast to participation. In the context of congregational music making, performance was being used to negatively describe what happens when the focus is placed on musicians on stage, performers, while congregations, the audience, uh, remains passive and uninvolved. In this view, performance was understood as engaging in a public act, kind of for its own sake, singing uh, for the sake of people hearing us sing, rather than for a larger purpose. When criticizing a worship gathering as a performance, people meant that the goal of leading the musical prayers of the people had been lost, that the leader and congregation had become distracted by something that shouldn't be their main focus. So in order to avoid the appearance of performing, some worship leaders went to great lengths uh, in trying even harder to be spontaneous and to, to seek and destroy patterns for fear that they become ruts. Or they resorted to uh, kind of sounding like a broken record, um, saying, I am not performing, again and again. And I started to find it particularly ironic that the very denial of performance had become part of a script. It was something that, you know, that you were expected to say at the, at the beginning of you know, what was not a performance. It was repeated over and over again, and eventually, honestly, started to sound kind of hollow. Uh, so I, I'd like to suggest a way forward uh, for us as church music leaders is not to deny that we perform, but instead change our understanding of what performance is. And so in order to do that, I want to draw uh, from some of the experts on performance. So scholars, uh, particularly in um, this new field, new since you know, the 1970s, uh, <coughs> look and compare music dance, theater, oratory, ritual, even sports um, across cultures. And one thing that these scholars agree on, and this is huge because scholars usually can't agree on much of anything, uh, is that performance is universal. Uh, the different kinds of performances that I just mentioned um, share certain common characteristics. And I'm drawing from um, Deborah Katchen here, who's uh, an ethnomusicologist who does <coughs> performance studies at NYU. She offers these four um, characteristics of performance. Performance, first of all, is public. Because performance is public, it's important for establishing individual and, and group identities. This is one of, uh, one of the important um, social functions that it serves. Secondly, um, according to Caption, performance, something that is set apart from daily practice 
How do we know that something you know, is a performance, that a performance of some sort has started? There's a set of genre conventions and sometimes a frame. If I were to say, once upon a time, you know how to interpret what comes next. I'm going to tell you a story you know, that you're not necessarily meant to interpret as, um, as being, being fact, but maybe that still has lessons uh, embedded in it for you to learn. Um, you know, we see these kinds of um, frames, you know, what in other contexts, you know, ritual frames, some um, scholars call them in, uh, in church, when uh, lights in the sanctuary dim, you know, when the music is about to get started, or in other churches where somebody walks up the aisle swinging a, uh, you know, one of those things, never can remember the name, that has incense in it. Thank you. <laughs> Censor. Uh, with, uh, with incense. So, um, performance is somehow set apart from daily practice. The third characteristic of performance, and kind of, you know, in some ways directly against uh, the meaning that I, I set out a couple of minutes ago, performance uh, is participative. Uh, depending on the performance, not everybody may participate in the same way. Sometimes there's a differentiation of roles. Um, if you're talking about, you know, oral performance and storytelling, you know, maybe some one person tells the story while the other person um, the, the other person is engaged in um, in listening, uh, or you know, exchanges in some ways their um, uh, their rapt attention. And fourthly, I think maybe the most important for our purposes, I'll spend some time unpacking this one. Performance is transformative. Uh, the way that uh, Deborah Caption says it, performance is agentive. That is, it either repeats or enacts change in the world. So based on Caption and, and some other scholars that I don't have time to go into right now, I'd like to suggest uh, this definition of performance for our purposes. Performance is a universal human activity that communicates our deepest beliefs and values through repeated public action and that transforms us in the process. The first part of that definition um, says that uh, performance is, first of all, a quintessentially human activity. Across time and culture, we make music, uh, we write plays, we relish uh, different kinds of rituals, we tell jokes, uh, you know, we, have, we give structured speeches that have introduction, you know, development, and uh, some kind of conclusion. Each of these kinds of performances have patterns, have a shape that allows us to understand how to interpret them and helps us to uh, communicate effectively. Recognizing these patterns in musical <coughs> worship, you know, for instance, um, the fact that has been pointed out that, um, that congregations more frequently lift their hands in choruses uh, than verses, or that um, you know, perhaps when improvising, you know, quote unquote, um, a transition, we kind of choose the same set of four chords over and over again, doesn't necessarily make what we do fake or contrived or manipulated. Rather, any performance relies on skills that have to be intentionally cultivated. When we're not careful, when we deny performance, we can minimize the importance of preparation uh, for uh, the quality more frequently seen as spiritual, that spontaneity that I mentioned earlier. But as you know, many performance theorists, and indeed as, as um, several writers on worship have pointed out, by increasing our freedom and honing our skills, uh, increasing our freedom and honing our skills are closely linked. In uh, an article um, called Worship as Performance, Ben Patterson uh, offers a memorable metaphor for the independence of discipline, skill, and spontaneity in worship. He writes, A good metaphor for the true freedom of disciplined Christian worship can be found in the dancer's art. Nothing looks more free and spontaneous than a great dancer performing. But beneath all of that, freedom and spontaneity are years of drills, repetition, sweat, strain, and more drills. Sunday morning worship is to the rest of our lives what cultivation is to a garden. We weed, prune, water, and feed to the end that the garden may be beautiful. Spontaneous gardens are not. Disciplined gardens are. Mm. So that's why I think that denying performance and aiming for some kind of impossible sort of pure spontaneity can be so counterproductive. When we deny that we're performing, we deny the responsibility that we've been given. Um, to hone our gifts and talents. A second aspect of, uh, of this definition of performance is, is that, that performance communicates. 
Music is one of many ways, of course, that we communicate and worship. Um, even without lyrics, music communicates. Exactly what it communicates may differ uh, from con between contexts over time and to different people. And for that reason, you know, we often find it difficult to put into words what exactly our music is saying. Uh, when what the musical styles and sounds we choose are actually saying to our congregation members, in fact, may sometimes surprise us. So rather than assuming that we already know what particular styles communicate to different audiences, I think as music leaders, we're responsible for figuring out what a musical style means to our present and potential worshipers, and whether that's the message that we actually want to send. What are we communicating when we use a particular song, or a style, or an instrument, or when we don't use it? What do we communicate when our songs that we sing in church are only uh, the most current, from the past um, three or four years, top of the CCLI charts, or when they're the most ancient? We don't sing when we um, perhaps imply that nothing written past 1900 is, uh, is worth singing. All of these aspects of musical performance speak volumes to our congregations and um, to visitors to them. Finally, um, performance transforms. Scholars have shown over and over again that performance of various kinds, especially musical performance, uh, has the potential to change people. One, um, I think, good quote um, to that effect, Richard Bauman in his um, article, Verbal Artist Performance, talks about the power and the responsibility that performers have. He says, it's part of the essence of performance that it offers participants a special enhancement of experience, bringing with it a heightened intensity of communicative, communicative interaction, which binds the audience to the performer in a way that's specific to the performance as a mode of communication. Through his or her performance, the performer elicits the participative attention and energy of his audience. And to the extent that they value his performance, they will allow themselves to be caught up in it. So, um, with this idea, um, when we take part in a performance, we communicate and reinforce to each other our shared beliefs and values. Every aspect of our actions, music, gesture, movement, communicates to us in a language beyond words. Making music together forms our identities as Christians, much as the same way uh, as our taking on spiritual disciplines through the week. These shape our inner being through faithful action, in the presence of and with encouragement from others, other members of the body of Christ. So through performance, um, there's also this, you know, one of the things that affects transformation is that um, it connects who we want to be, our ideal selves that are being made new in the image of Christ with our present, you know, sort of admittedly imperfect state of being. <laughs> the fact that performing our beliefs together uh, suggests that, uh, that God uses social and musical forces to act upon us and to transform us from, uh, I'd suggest, the outside in as well as the inside out. So far, I've presented performance as you know, this, um, this definition going back, a human activity that can be used to build Christian community and that God can use to transform us into uh, the likeness of Christ. Because performance can be such a powerful and transformative gift, rather than make performance the culprit, maybe we should use another word. Uh, I've been pleased recently to hear fewer people badmouth uh, performance. They've replaced this word with uh, things like performancism or performanceitis, um, a couple of terms that I've, I've seen recently. So, uh, with uh, performanceitis, um, you know, based on the definition I gave you a few minutes ago, I think performanceitis is what happens when we fail to think about what our performance is communicating. Uh, when we c communicate conflicting messages, you know, through you know, some perceived conflict in um, music, lyrics, gesture, um, all of the things that go into our worship, or uh, when we don't have transformation, uh, or at least the right kind of transformation uh, as our goal. Oftentimes, uh, I guess the problem with performancism uh, is that we don't know that we're doing this. Performancism is difficult to root out because it's an activity that you know, that's largely unconscious, that we may only realize when we look back in, uh, in retrospect. 
So avoiding it, I think, requires that we constantly generate opportunities to take a critical look at our practice um, and uh, kind of retool our perspective. So kind of in conclusion, for a, um, a few uh, practical pointers, I want to give um, yeah, practical pointers of where you might start in uh, rooting out performancism in, um, in your particular uh, area of ministry. So first off, I would say watch your languages um, you know, with, a, uh, with an S, all of them. Uh, worship leaders and musicians uh, need to learn to be mindful of the many ways that we communicate ideas and values to the congregation. So when we lead congregational music making, spoken and sung words, you know, these are only two of the many different ways that we communicate. We communicate um, through, through gesture, we communicate through how we use the performance space, we communicate um, through song choice, um, through um, so many of these things, through what we say in between the songs, or how much we say when we preach a sermonette, you know, uh, before we, um, when we introduce our, um, each of the songs that we lead. And our verbal message, the message will ring hollow if aspects of the medium um, are interpreted to say something different. What are we communicating when we sing about the greatness of God while all the congregation uh, sees as our gigantic faces up on screens? Um, what are we actually saying when we claim uh, unity with other Christians across culture and time, but we never sing anything uh, beyond the CCLI Top 25 or beyond our denomination's hymnal? So watch, watch your language in, uh, in worship. Um, a second I guess a bit of advice, relinquish control. As I mentioned, you know, performancism can happen when we don't have our congregation's transformation into the image of Christ firmly in our sights uh, as the goal. People are transformed when they participate in a performance, and sometimes that transformation, uh, you know, maybe into into something else. We can transform uh, people certainly into passive spectators. We can transform uh, by our actions. We can, you know, encourage them into into that model. And uh, sometimes we're tempted to think that musical quality is more important than encouraging members of the congregation to participate. And I've seen, um, yeah, over, um, over the years, many worship gatherings that seek to create a wall of sound that sort of dominates rather than supports the collective voice. And I've heard, you know, the drown out trend isn't limited to, you know, contemporary worship. Um, I've heard it in churches small and large across denomination and, uh, and musical style, whether it's a guitar band or, you know, an organ that you can't hear the person uh, next to you um, singing over. So we encourage an orientation towards performances of when we define a worship experience by the permeation of perfect sound. But we need to remember that our corporate worship on Sunday mornings is more than a sing-along. It's a powerful, formative symbol for the Christian life in which everyone has a role to play. If the congregation, well, is the congregation participating meaningfully if they can't hear their own voice? Uh, or worse, if they come to believe that their voice isn't a desirable part of the mix. As music leaders, we um, need to constantly seek creative ways to, I think, to relinquish control of the collective sound and to cultivate our congregation's voice. A third um, tip for avoiding performancism um, that I'd throw in here is don't conform. Uh, we are under constant pressure, and I'm being bombarded constantly every day by about 16 emails from all of the, uh, the various um, you know, worship music um, you know, celebrities and publishers and things that I'm subscribed to that, uh, to adopt models from their influential churches or from the Christian music industry or from you know, particular um, you know, influential megachurch pastors and so on. And, you know, and, and it's, it's okay to admit, I mean, many of these models and resources work really well um, working in working toward the goal of transformation in the context that they come from. 
but they might be totally inappropriate for a congregation of a different culture, a different region, a different denomination, or a different size. If we're not careful, I think our music and, uh, and worship can be determined more by the cult of popularity than what actually works in the local context that we're called to. So, um, as part of Don't Conform, I think we should seek to cultivate the songs, styles, and messages that will build up our congregation, even if they're unpopular. Um, and I think I'll add an addendum to that. I think probably, you know, especially, um, yes, th those of us, you know, in uh, college and graduate school um, can, can be tempted to, to kind of turn this around and make... Um, make non-conformity and, and conform to non-conformity. So basically, the pressure is to, to find what the most unpopular thing is and embrace that. Because nobody else is doing it. So it's like, the, it's like tipster conformity, you know? Um, so watch out for that, too. Um, so even if, so, so maybe I should turn that around and say, we should seek to cultivate the song styles and messages that will build up our congregation, even if they're popular. So, popular more unpopular. Um, and, and lastly, um, I would say, you know, and I say this, you know, I, uh, with an element of, um, you know, of, uh, of, of fun, you know, experiment. Transformation uh, is hard and sometimes uncomfortable work, and I think we all have a tendency to fall into um, complacency. If we, when we don't have transformation as our goal, performancism often um, emerges, you know, because of our, you know, relatively narrow horizons. When we have a steady diet of one style of worship music or one type of liturgy, uh, you know, with worship music, whether it's pop rock, whether it's gospel, whether it's um, organ-led hymns, it becomes easy to trust in our own competency, which kind of leads back to the, um, uh, the where we want to take control um, of the sound. But I think that it's humbling and um, strangely freeing to realize that music, the musical style that we've mastered is only one among legions. Currently available, you know, in, um, in our contemporary culture, of course, you know, we have 2,000 um, plus years of uh, music of the church and before that of um, God's chosen people, Israel, to, uh, to draw from. And so um, for new sources of inspiration, we can seek out those treasures uh, across the world or uh, over the two millennia of Christian history, explore fledgling song traditions um, the world over and bring some of those uh, to enliven our worship and to remind us and our congregations uh, you know, that we are not to be be-all and end-all of, um, of Christian history um, and that we are connected to people in uh, lots of different times and places. So it's harder, I think, to give into performances when we are constantly learning um, and, and growing as, uh, as musicians and, uh, and as, uh, as leaders. And finally, I mean, in addition to all of these things that are kind of implied just throughout, I would add that we should stop denying that we're performing. Denying that church music is performance is kind of like denying that Baptists have a tradition. Um, which I have, having grown up Baptist, I feel like I can, you know, I, I can say that my church denied that it had a tradition, even though um, you know it largely fell uh, you know, within a particular um, theological tradition and uh, had a fairly set liturgy that happened um, every Sunday. By tradition, you know, most people mean a set of beliefs and practices that's handed down from generation to generation, and that's that's not that's not a bad thing. Um, denying the church music as a performance, you know, to take it up a level from that, is kind of like um, also denying that, um, or I'll risk stepping, stepping on some toes, uh, denying that Christianity is a religion. Uh, most people mean by religion um, a set of beliefs and practices through which we understand and approach God. Um, Christians can, um, certainly we can engage with people of other religions saying that ours, you know, putting forth reasons why ours is true, um, but the, the difference is, is not, you know, religion and not religion. It's true religion um, and, uh, and false religion, I think. Um, it makes us, when we constantly deny um, these things, it honestly can make us look um, ignorant to those outside the faith, um, to have our own special insidery, you know, sorts of meanings.
that we inject into these words. And uh, and I think as you know, as I've tried to you know kind of gently, through through gently you know poking fun you know maybe at some of these things, I think our constant denials of performance and of some of these other things ultimately ring hollow. And worse, these denials can be a way um, that we can sideline or neglect our responsibility for the transformation that occurs under our watch as um, as worship leaders. A transformation that, of course, you know, we would say, you know, that God is ultimately responsible for uh, for bringing through, but that we as co-creators uh, do have a responsibility for. So as music leaders, um, I think to get beyond the question of whether or not we're performing uh, when we lead worship would be constructive. We are. We are performing. Um, then I think we're freed up to ask the better question. Is our performance faithful? Thank you. Um, I really liked what you had to say about performance and the way that we kind of have created this uh, um, this kind of evil out of it. Um, but a question that I have is how do we um, how do we embrace now this aspect of um, it's okay you know to be a performer as a church musician, but at the same time uh, really shun the notion that worship is about ourselves. You know, um, just what. It, just what are some things you would say? Yeah. Well, as far as um, you know, as far as making worship you know, not about ourselves, I think it comes back to I mean this aspect of, of finding ways to relinquish control and finding ways to share uh, creative control or perhaps um, song choices you know with our congregations, bringing them into the process as much as possible. Because I think, and I'm glad that you pointed that out, because I think that that's become in some ways another mantra you know that we that worship leaders say that worship leaders sing, that people write songs about, it's not about us, it's not about us. If we say that enough, then it'll be true. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think there are other things that are happening, you know, again, maybe some mixed messages uh, that we're communicating, you know, one thing with our words, but perhaps other things by our practice. But I do think that that, um, yeah, I mean, just to bring it back to relinquishing control, finding ways to engage our congregations in the creative process is a, is a good way around that. Just going on with that, I, I think I would say that the best performance is not self-centered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been studying things, and if you yes. are thinking about yourself, yeah. that's not mm -hmm. the true yeah. part of performance, that the real performance Absolutely. comes out just to share. Yes. To connect. Yes. And that's what we do with church. Yeah. That's an excellent observation. And one that, uh, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about the, I guess, the, the discourse about performance, you know, within church circles and things, is that um, there, are, there are some interesting parallels to, um, you know, to say, to popular music performance. And a lot of the, the most successful rock bands, the most successful pop acts, are those that do somehow manage to, you know, genuinely communicate, you know, where performance is, um, you know, in some ways, you know, these these rules, um, you know, are true beyond, you know, just the the church setting, and um, you know, and I think that uh, that we could look to well, uh, people who study performance say that you know these are characteristics of successful performances, kind of work across genres. So yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, I really appreciated the quote that you used from uh, Richard Bowman, is that yeah. the right way to say it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that gave um, you know, validity and credence to the role of the audience. Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. the fact that it is mm -hmm. okay, because I know yeah. myself as a worshiper, I can worship vicariously through someone else offering their gifts. You yes. know, namely through the choir or you know, yeah. or an orchestra or you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That I, you know, I don't and that comes back to the individual in the audience that they're mm -hmm. you know seeking to actively participate still. But yeah, I, you know I can worship very deeply through times where I'm sitting there and observing still. I, I mean you know I'm not physically doing anything that other people are seeing, but I'm still. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely, yeah, and that's an important point to make, and I think that maybe something that 
um, you know, that at least the, you know, the, the Christian worship tradition that I study has, has sort of lost over time is that idea that we can, that, that you know, <coughs> congregation members are going to replace, you know, audience mm -hmm. with congregation, you know, this, um, in this particular example, that yeah, that you can identify deeply with what you know, a musical specialist is doing or saying, that there's effective communication that doesn't necessitate that everybody do the same thing. Um, so that it doesn't necessitate that we all be singing exactly the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how do we gain that back? If we've lost, <laughs> as a congregation, the ability mm -hmm. to participate through listening, mm -hmm. how do we encourage that and bring that back to the forefront. Mm, that's an excellent question, yeah. and uh, and something that say so something that people are you know people are struggling with. It's it's, it's a lot to I and mean, we have a lot of cultural baggage you know again mm. to you know to mm. get over in that account. Mm. I mean I would say um, you know the best thing that we can do is uh, is to teach. I mean is to teach. Um, well, to teach even, um, you know, having, having classes, uh, you know, Sunday school classes, I'm a big advocate for having music related, you know, um, adult Sunday school or um, focusing on, you know, perhaps on uh, books about worship in small groups. Um, small groups, uh, we need to do more, I think, than just simply, you know, say two sentences on a Sunday morning. I don't think that that's going to get uh, you know, the message through. It may help, you know, uh, prefacing a, um, a solo. Um, I know something that, well, just thinking about my, um, you know, my own experience in, in church in the past uh, few weeks. My husband is a is a minister, and he's been noticing. I don't know if this happens in any of, any of your churches, but a disturbing trend that a lot of people talk through the anthem. It, it drives him crazy that the, you know, the choir has put put forth all of this work and it seems to be this time you where know, the people in the congregation catch up on uh, you know, yeah. their, uh, catch up on, on uh, the news of the week rather than um, listening to this offering. So he's taken to, um, you know, I, he was complaining about it, you know, that he said something one week and, and the people who really needed to, to hear him um, say it weren't there. And so I suggested that he say it for the next four weeks you know, before the before the anthem to make sure that everybody gets the point and then you know do the you know confrontation if uh, if need be. But uh, but I think um, to, to come back to your initial question that um, that teaching throughout the week, you know, in addition to framing things in the service as things happen uh, is what's needed. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought about um, if you thought the action of applause in a service contributed mm -hmm. at all to this mindset. Yeah. <laughs> oh, applause. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Uh, because applause, I mean, even applause itself, uh, you know, going back to you know, musical styles, having different meanings to different audiences, the act of applause um, has very different meanings to different audiences too, and for uh, for a lot of people who are um, you know, who come out of kind of what would you say um, kind of Western classical concert culture, I'll just call it call it that. Applause is something that we reserve. You know, the appropriate way to listen to great music is to be completely silent, to not move your body, and then at the very end, you know, you're permitted this uh, you know this this expression of appreciation. In other cultures, um, particularly, I mean, just I can single out um, a couple. I mean, in um, in Latin America, in uh, some parts of Latin America, in um, Afri Africa, and its diaspora, um, applause and other kinds of you know gestures and bodily movements are much more naturally integrated into the fabric of a performance. Um, and so, so I would say, yeah, applause. It really depends on the context and knowing your context and what you know, what applause means there, and then you can figure out whether or not, you know, you think it's worth trying to, you know, trying to alter, you know, that, that meaning, you know, by bringing in, by making it a teaching, teaching movement. That's cool. Do you think um, Kierkegaard's uh, idea of the audience of one kind of mm. helps to, helps to um, support the fact that performance can be uh, can happen at church too. I think that kind of helps to support it. That's I, I do, and I and I on on the whole, you know, I do um, like that metaphor. You know, as far as 
um, I, I like the metaphor up to an extent because it emphasizes that whether you know, you're leading the music or whether you're in the congregation participating in congregational song, you know, we are all performing together, you know, for, uh, you know, for a divine audience. What I think, you know, I mean, any metaphor has its, has its limitations, and I think one, one thing that, uh, that might be a little bit dangerous about that, that particular metaphor is ignoring, you know, it is making God into the passive spectator, you know, so God sitting back and, um, you know, kind of doing nothing or, you know, with a clipboard evaluating, you know, our collective <laughs> performance, when actually, you know, it's a much more, it's a cyclical, it's a, you know, God is inspiring us to perform, um, you know, we are performing, he is taking joy in that, you know, while continuing um, to inspire it. So, so I do think that that's useful as long as we keep the, you know, that dynamic in mind. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, since we have this uh, idea that, you know, it's okay to be performers, it's not something to be, you know, frowned upon or anything, you know, mm. uh, would you still suggest, just for the sake of not freaking a whole bunch of people out, <laughs> that you don't, you know, you just don't, you just don't make a big deal out of it, you don't mm. go up there and you say, you don't mm. say, hey, I'm performing, but it's okay, <laughs> <laughs> you just really kind of yes. avoiding the term, like, altogether, you know. That's absolutely, yeah, and I, and I think that I, uh, you know, I chose this, I mean, obviously all of you are, you know, going to be in the position of, Performing, I don't think I'm not sure that this particular conversation you know, would necessarily be particularly edifying, you know, for your congregations. <laughs> and and yes, please don't replace denial of performances with avowals of performance. I am here to perform. <laughs> I not go over so well. It might be more more hindering. Um, than, than I think it's really interesting that when we say something uh, too much, people become suspicious of us. <laughs> Whatever the case, you know, usually the person who yeah. is, you know, adamantly saying the same thing over and over, like, you know, there's something to be uh, <laughs> considered there. Uh, I think that's that's important. I also think it's interesting in in my experience that different places within the church accuse each other of performance. Yeah. And then again, it's contextual uh, that sometimes the more art music, Western art music crowd will mm -hmm. feel very much as if um, performance means lights and microphones and all of those things which would be much more prominent in one context. Mm -hmm. And yet for that group, the whole idea of a choir singing something that's prepared and rehearsed and whatever, that would be mm -hmm. incredibly a performance model. Mm -hmm. And so it really is mm -hmm. very much contextual. And yes. And you, can, and you often can tell what's considered performance by um, who asks the question about applause, I think. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can tell, the, tell what is considered by what, is, what gets applause and how and where and within that context. So um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of important things. But I wonder, when did performance become a bad word? How did we start to think? When did we become defensive about yeah. performance? Yeah. I can answer that for myself, but I wondered yeah. what your thoughts. Uh, what? I that's that's a really good question, and my my guess is my my, my totally you know kind of, kind of un unexpert um, sort of um, guess is that as long as performance has had the resonances of uh, you know kind of a, a single individual or group. Um, that is doing something for a larger group of people who are largely observing and watching. Um, that that it's had that that resonance for um, you know for that long. I think that um, I'm trying to remember a book um, when church became theater is a really interesting uh, work of um, I think it's a cultural cultural geography that talks about when church spaces went from. Um, you know, started taking on these these functions that were um, functions and appearance. You know, of the of the music hall. I mean, we see this in uh, the last chapter of the book talks about you know mega churches that look like well, conference centers, convention centers that look like um, other kinds of, of spaces. So I think that at least 
you know, in our context, for you know, within the American context, that, that perhaps the you know, beginning of the, I think the author you know draws this kind of end of the, the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, when you know church spaces started to resemble theatrical spaces. There may have been an outgrowth um, then of concern about performance. But one thing that I should mention is that you know I've kind of been I've been drawing from largely kind of um, predominantly uh, predominantly white contemporary or at least you know of 2007 you know, eight um, uh, you know field work among um, evangelicals um, white evangelicals in the U S I think that uh, that performance has these you know these two resonances there's one. Um, excellent study of um, of gospel music in a, um, a spirit-filled African American congregation, where um, you know he explores what performance means to this group of people, and uh, and particularly the authenticity end of thing. That that element um, is is definitely part and parcel of it. So I think it's broader than just certainly than just contemporary evangelicalism. I'm not sure where it started, but we can see. You know the concern um, grow out sort of again and again um, through the U.S. starting at the you know at least the beginning of the 19th century, and David can probably take us back. What is that supposed to be? I would like to say it. when I've heard performance being criticized in church musicians, it, it's typically come from pastors. Yeah. Mm. who don't seem to realize that they're involved in a kind of performance uh, themselves. Mm. Like, uh, yeah. well, one of the biggest areas of research right now in preaching is the performance aspect yeah. of mm. proclamation. Mm -hmm. And pastors are really, or preachers, people say preaching, are really beginning to get into um, lots of articles and things are being produced now about delivery and okay. and method and mm. all of those kind of things, where for so long preaching really was about uh, text and yeah. those kinds of things. It was about having the right script and the right words. And yeah. really, right now, it's very much around mm -hmm. the presentation. Okay. So I think preaching is mm -hmm. moving into that element. And it always That's has been about that. We just yeah. haven't admitted it. Just haven't admitted it. So a lot yes. of what you're saying really is yeah. what has always been. We just haven't yeah. been honest. That's right. right. And, and, when we, and when we admit it, and I think that it's so important for us to admit it, because as you said, when we you know, just acknowledge that this is what we're doing, it opens up a whole That's range right. of conversations that we can have. Um, it, it opens up the topic, and if we yeah. don't perform, then what happens to the days when we feel yeah. horrible, <laughs> and we actually have nothing within us to offer, yeah. and yet yeah. offering nothing would be not very sacred either. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? You know, I've mm -hmm. always said, you know, yeah. well, we, we do what it is ours to do, and we trust yeah. God to use that, we trust God to use. I, I often talk Absolutely. about sometimes we believe ourselves into action, yeah. and sometimes we act ourselves into belief. Yes, absolutely. And we have to have both of those. <coughs> and as church mm -hmm. musicians, we want to have both of those intact, or we're in a mess. Yes, thanks. That's an excellent, yeah, excellent application. And I think, you know, I think a lot of it is that with our Western Christianity, we focus so much on individual, and we don't, you know, we don't give enough credence to the, you know, the congregation and the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. and I think it's, I can't remember, maybe in one of the classes I've had with my brother, but we talk about, um, you know, um, singing, singing the song for someone else on the day that they can't mm -hmm. sing it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and understand that we are all the body of Christ and we can yeah. help hold each other up. And some days we're yes. not going to be able to worship, but, or, you know, to absolutely. the best of our ability, but other yes. people can help us. So. That's right. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. I mean, yeah. do that in song. I mean, there are so many, many aspects of the service. You know, I'll never, uh, never forget this, this friend of mine um, that I had that we attended the same church um, for a while when, that, when I lived in Nashville. And she had, you know, she was very open about uh, really serious you know, um, doubts, struggles, you know, with her faith, you know, said she's a Christian, you know, probably, you know, she believes all of this stuff, you know, on a good week, you know, four out of seven days. Uh, but when she comes, when she comes to church, um, you know, she loves to, um, this was a church where the creed was said um, every Sunday, and she said that that was so meaningful for her because the rest of the congregation was performing for her, you know, the belief 
you know, that she didn't quite have at the time, but hoped to, you know, work through some of these things and, um, and have it carry, carry her through. But absolutely, yeah, like you said, music could do the same thing. I think related to that is another idea that I have of the idea of singing ourselves into belief. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that in a sense it's performance. It's singing it so many times that you believe it. Mm -hmm. And it's because most of much of what we sing, I'm not convinced we can authentically believe on certainly every given day. And yeah. sometimes maybe yeah. not any given mm -hmm. day. But yeah. it doesn't mean that we don't want to yeah. believe it. And no, it doesn't right. mean that we don't sing it so much that yeah. we begin to believe it and that it does seep into us. And yeah. in a sense that's performance. And mm -hmm. I think life mm -hmm. is made yeah. in some way of going through the right rituals long enough <laughs> that eventually they become the us and yes. they're inseparable. Kind of like our yeah. discussion at lunch today about teaching. Which is a kind of a different. Yeah. Yes, and I think that that aspect of the you know kind of uh, one of the things that I emphasized uh, earlier with um, uh, with the uh, you know, the transforming us in uh, in the process is reconciling that um, as you said the ideal you know the, the aspirational where we want to be who we want to be um, and and we do say and there are some I mean actually there are. Um, you know, there, were some, there are some that would disagree, you know, that would say that on a Sunday morning, you know, that it's, that it's wrong, you know, based on this, you know, very kind of strict um, reading of authenticity that, um, you know, that we should only say things that are true, you know, at, you know, at all times and all places, but I think that that limits, um, that limits, well, it limits our vision, it limits our, our vision of, you know, what is, and it also denies that people, that we, you know, and people in our congregations are in a lot of different places at at any given any any given time. And so there needs to be space for, you know, in the music that we plan, in the in the words that we sing or say, space, you know, for everybody to be able to um, to locate themselves. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Ingalls. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Remember to sign the roll sheet and sign up for the lunch if you...